Okay, Carolyn's going to show me into the galleries here at the International Quilt Museum. The back way. The back way. Come on, everybody. <laughs> As you can tell, we just had an event. So there's lots of things. Our event was Tara's lecture. All right. So one more hallway. Lots of doors here. Lots of locked doors. Behind the scenes tour. And now, gallery lights are off, but as we walk in, they will come on. Voila. Mm -hmm. So, we're in the bridge now. Yeah. There's the West Gallery with layered and stitch, and these are the miniatures from Gita Candlewall. One of our wonderful board members who made all of these miniatures while she was home with COVID, not with COVID, but during COVID. I sure wish I would have gotten something like this accomplished. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at how precious these are. I'm not touching it, but I'm going to put my finger up for scale because look. Oh my and goodness. This is just her extra stuff. This, we have a whole gallery of Gita's pieces here. <gasps> and you haven't even seen this yet. Tremendous. So the full size pieces are from our collection. And you can see how Gita was inspired by them. Most come from India, Pakistan. Um, I think just India and Pakistan. And then we also have um, clothing from these different cultures and different time periods. And so Gita has done the very specific type of clothing that would have been worn in different areas. So this is actually Persian. Look at these tiny, tiny. And she really tried to use the fabric that would have been appropriate, all of the historic details, and they all have like, it might be just a different neckline or a different tie or something that really distinguishes them. But they are so charming. And she said she didn't have to buy any fabric because each has been collecting fabric forever. <laughs> so she said, I just went into my own fabrics. Don't you love these? Look at the tiny little neck I can't even on that. imagine how you how you hold something while you sew it when it's so tiny. Yeah. They're, they're stunning. And I remember when we looked when we went to India, we bought this piece. And Pat Cruz and I were looking at this and we're like, that has to be machine quilted. It can't be as old as they say it is. It has to be machine quilted. But it's actually all hand stitched. It is the most beautiful stitching you've ever seen. Look at that, it is. It's perfectly hand stitched. Oh, wow. And that neckline. We had so much fun when we went to India because Pat Cruz is such a scholar of textiles. So she, when people would show us things in their shop, she would say, well, is this this or is this this? And they'd be like, oh, she knows what she's talking about. And almost invariably, they would say, okay, when we close in a couple hours, come back and we'll show you our private museum in the back. And of course, Pat is a beautiful, blonde, tall woman, and they were just enthralled with her. And But she knew exactly what they were showing us. She had read all these, I mean, it was crazy. I'll never forget this man pulled out a little piece. I can't remember if it was formed into anything but it was sewn out of beetle's wings, <gasps> shiny blue beetle's wings. It, I, I'd seen them in books. I'd never seen anything person. in person. And this was like in this man's like desk drawer where he was like his prized possession that he couldn't wait to show Pat Cruz because she knew so much about all of their art forms. And it was just crazy. It was so much fun. So we went on kind of a, just a tourist visit, but we did a lot of shopping. This piece. Isn't that gorgeous? That's a little bit of a newer one, but it's kind of a technique that they're using where they put a lot of old textiles that are kind of falling apart. They re upcycle them, I guess, what you'd say, into new pieces. Right. A lot of beautiful mirror work. Yeah, all of that handwork in here. 
So this is what Maren Hansen does as our international curator. She's the expert on all things non-American or European. She is the one who works with all these collections. It just, it, sh it sparkles. And it you, does. I'm gonna move the phone a little bit, but see there's, oh, it's like little twinkling of stars anyway. <laughs> and today you can't really, well, in the newer textiles, you don't get actual mirrors. They just use like an aluminum piece. Mm -hmm. So the original mirrors are kind of cool to see. And that's what um, they explained to us, like pieces like this would have been used, especially for ceremonies. They would use the mirrors. And when you're there, and it's dark in the evening and everything is lit by candles. And then you see all these mirrors reflecting that light. It is oh, magical. Oh, I bet. It is magical. exquisite yeah that was that was an amazing trip it was super cool and look at this kawambi made in Karnataka today see so we would look at that and they think she's bent uh-huh and this is just another technique and what's using fabric layering fabric yeah and this is a very popular technique right now with yeah. modern quilters and this isn't terribly old. This is 1970 to 2000. We don't always know exactly when, but it's a tradition of a specific area. And in India, as you go down the road to the next community, you almost always find a different textile tradition. So it's really fascinating to be there. Interesting. And imagine like you're driving along and these quilts are just out like over a fence or <laughs> over the building drying or women, are, you know what I mean? You see somebody come by with a cart and the cart is just stacked full of textiles. Whoa. It's just like the most mind boggling thing. Oh, I want to go. <laughs> yeah. Sold. And there's a few more Indian pieces here, Indian rallies. Check, I mean, making. this makes such an impact when you walk into this gallery here. These are the largest textiles we've ever shown at the museum, and you can't even see them all because they're so tall. So what do we got, about four or five feet wrapped over? Yeah, will you go stand over there so we get a perspective view? Like this is, and, and y'all, Carolyn's taller than I am. <laughs> Aren't they gorgeous? They're amazing. I don't ever want to take these down. I don't ever want to take these down. Right, why should you have to? <laughs> I know other things need to come in, but that's tremendous. And Mara did a beautiful job finding these wonderful photos on the labels. So, like this photo, you can actually see people in these would have been tents to put up for special occasions or for meetings or whatever oh. you needed space for. And the photos just give it such great context. Oh, they really do. They would have really been used. Look how. It's like, so this would be one, that's another one, uh -huh. that's another one, I guess. Fantastic. 1900, huh? Yeah, these are really, really special. And a lot of people have heard of the tent makers of Cairo that are still active. The quilt makers, be careful behind you. Um, so there are still men that are actively doing this kind of work. You can still go and you can get beautiful applique textiles. I think there's like one street where they all work. I don't know much about the contemporary makers, but it still is a tradition that's practiced. I'm just going to come up to this. Oh, look at those stitches. I love these pieces so much. Oh, they're just, I mean, when I saw the exhibit on the website, it looked amazing, but this, there's nothing that prepares you for walking into the room and seeing this. Love. Think about these traditions and, and how you can see kind of relationships that we know as quilt making traditions. Yes. But there's something about design and certain designs that are just, they must do something to our brain in some way that you see them over time and across areas. Cultures, across. Well, if you look at this piece over here, which is another one I love. So these are Central Asia. So there's Tushkis, um, which is from Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan. Um, the stands, but I was blown away the first time I saw these because we had no idea that this tradition even was around. 
Um, and these are not meant to be quilts, they're meant to be decorations. So you would seat your guest in front of the two skis. This would be the place of honor in your home or maybe even your yurt because many of these people were um, migratory and they you know, lived in yurts that could be collapsed and travel with them. So they, it was really important for them to you have that decoration of their home. But when I saw these with all these triangles, I'm like, it's a wild goose chase. It's a flying geese. And this has been oh going gosh, on forever. And look at this tiny little oh. pineapple log cabin. I mean, have you ever seen such a tiny little thing? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's my finger, people. It's the tiniest, tiniest little thing. And so they use these, and they oh, use a, a lot of- That's courthouse steps. Mm-hmm. So you just start realizing that quilting is so much wider and prevalent than we know. And you wouldn't call these quilts. One of the things that we did learn pretty quickly when we were traveling internationally is that you would ask about patchwork rather than quilts because sometimes oh. it was just the patchwork that was being done. Sure. But look how closely it relates to what we know as quilting. Yes. So, so where did it start at? Who knows? It, and how did it explode in numerous different places? It's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling. And like they're using turkey red in here, which we're so familiar with, and our turkey red, but this is turkey red from Russia. And so the reds just have a little different color to them. Some of the prints are just a little bit different. And then they also, um, in these areas, and I don't, let's see what we're talking about I wish here. red wasn't so hard to photograph because the color that's coming through on the phone well, it's very orange, is a little it? bit is it's different. It's more of a claret. Kind it's, of yeah, it's more of um, a wine, purpley red yeah so these this is from Kyrgyzstan and um, I can't remember what I was gonna say I'm sorry that's all right I just I just find it so fast oh that's it I was gonna say the other tradition that we see from this area is they are um, known for their ikat weaving what's that so oh, the ikat is oh. when you dye your fat your threads first and then you weave them and that's what, um, when we discovered, we didn't, when we learned about these, I try not to say we discovered them because they're not a new discovery. Um, but when we learned about this, it was through a woman named Chris Martins, who was an expert on felted textiles from the area. They also do a lot of really beautiful felted pieces. So we just said, have you heard anything about patchwork? Do you know anything about quilts? And she said, no, but I know all the textile dealers. So she started asking and these, Crazy, amazing things have come out of this. Wow. Oh. We have a great exhibition called Sacred Scraps on our website that has all of our pieces from this area. But it is, I don't know, I just, I, and I, Marin did a really great lecture for AQSG. She was the keynote one year. Yeah, and I was there for that. She just did, I, what I always remember, I don't remember specifics, but she just tied everything together mm -hmm. and said, we are all sharing this certain space. We all love textiles, but as human beings, we all share that love of textiles and design and, you know, making your space beautiful. She just had such a beautiful way of tying it into kind of how I feel like you want to be as a person in this world, being like a really an international person, not being aware that we don't have to have these countries and boundaries. It was just, it was an amazing, amazing lecture. Yeah, it I really was. I wonder if that one is, um, it's not recorded. They didn't record, they no. don't transcribe them, I don't think either. Uh -uh. But Martin needs to give that lecture again. I think it was just so perfect for the place we are in the world today. I think so, absolutely. I can, I'm, if I could just really quickly, I'm gonna back up over here for a second to show these, the Raleigh's. Yes. Now I have a coworker from uh, whose family's from Pakistan, and he called them Rillies. Maybe I've seen them spelled R I L L I. Um, we use R A L L I, and I'm sure there are different ways it's that people have used. Probably it. different dialects or something. Yeah. I, you know. And here we go again with the courthouse steps yes. kind of thing with a nine patch in the middle. And right next to you, kind of a pinwheel design. Yeah. And Mara wanted to create this. Um, we used our education, excuse me, our education collection for these pieces that we strung up. But she wanted to create a space because that's how the textiles would have been used. Right. So you see that in the photo, how you would have created a tent space by using your textiles. And 
And these were also used for bedding, they were used to wrap things, they were just used for everything. And again, in this northern, kind of northwestern um, India, they're a nomadic tribe. Yeah. And they carry these with them. And the coolest thing about, I think, about our rallies is that a lot of our collection came from Patricia Stoddard, who wrote the book on rally quilts. And that part of the country where these quilts are made floods regularly, and especially recently has had some devastating floods. Well, when Pat, um, Patricia and um, another scholar went back to this area, they had acquired pieces for us, and we said, we want you to go back and interview the quilt makers and interview these people who made the quilts. So Trish and um, Martha, I can't remember Martha's last name, they come into this little village and they start talking to a gentleman about their quilt patterns and you know, how, do, where, how did your tradition survive? How do you know what patterns were used? He went inside and brought Trisha's book outside and said, this is our Bible. <gasps> and she said, I'm the one who wrote that. Oh, wow, and what a moment. I mean, it still gives me chills. They made the, she had Trisha and Martha like goddesses for the day. They put them in a cart and drove them around. They were like, if you had not written this book and taken those pictures, we would not know what our traditions were. And they are, in fact, are really grateful that our, the collection is here because the way it's it's a lower caste, people are not collecting the quilts, they're not gonna end up in museums there. And so we have preserved this tradition, which is really an amazing thing to think that you have a hand in something oh, that's so important. I can't imagine what she must have felt in that oh moment gosh, to, feel, to know that she, she'd contribute, given back, really. You know. you know, it's it's an interesting, we have this discussion all the time about, you know, cultural appropriation and taking items from other countries. Mm -hmm. And it is fraught, and you wish things didn't have to be that way. But we also are really, really lucky that we are able to have a museum that can preserve these things, where in a lot of countries, textiles are so ubiquitous, they're so used for everything, so they're not something people think about saving. Right. And unfortunately in a lot of countries, or maybe they just don't have the means to save them. Well, and in here, in this space, in what the International Quilt Museum offers is a space where these things can be seen in their relationship to each other. Instead of in isolation, like this is from this area, like, you can see, like we were just talking about those relationships, and it's so much easier to see those connections when they're together, these items are together in the same space, or you've been seeing them within a small time frame. You know, I've seen this one this month and this other thing soon after, then you go, oh, I see it, I see that relationship, I made the connection. Yeah. It's beautiful. These are and honestly we just didn't we had no awareness of what we would find out in the world when we started out. We were still functioning like Pat Chris and I were talking about how like remember how early on in quilt history we talk about how people would take palampores and they would cut them apart and make chintz quilts out of them. And I remember Pat and I sitting there looking at a chintz quilt in the collection, and we're like, this is not a fabric from India. This is not what we know is probably not it's not not correct. Maybe there were people that early on did that, but what we know is American quilts are not made that way. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I just remember very clearly, Pat and I looking at each other like, what we knew as history and knowledge is not what we're seeing in the quilts. Right. And it just, and I think that that's one of the most exciting things that the museum's been able to do is just to be able to add to the knowledge of what we know of quilts. and to put it in an international perspective I think is so important. That's so, it's critical. Because you just don't understand otherwise. And you know, we like to think, oh, we're American quilt making is such a big deal, but we're the, the newbies. Just we like are the newbies. Else. We're the newbies, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. These are and it was really amazing too, when we started collecting internationally, that's when we really realized we kind of had to break out of the quilt mode to a certain degree. So some of our pieces are just, they're not quilted, they're applique, or they're piecing, they're tent panels, or they're clothing, or 
we, you know, and it was funny because again, Pat um, Cruz and I were having this discussion and she said, you know, we just have to be really careful. We want to stay true to our mission as a quilt museum. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Pat, we've already kind of broken that rule because if you think about it, a crazy quilt's not quilted. Right. Log cabin quilts aren't quilted. Right. She's like, yeah, you're right. We have already broken that rule. And yeah. that's when I was like, we have to, we have to respond to what's there. Right. We can't expect it to be bed coverings or this or that, but look at what it really is. Let it teach us. Let it teach us. Instead of trying to prescribe exactly. onto it what we want it to say, we have to listen yes. to the textiles and what they're saying. These things are just, I can't get it. I can't. Like, that's insane. Look at that. But speaking of American quilt making, you know, we always try to have a wide variety here. We always want art quilts, we want international, and we want traditional. So come see our traditional ones. Oh, yes. I love this collection. The Ohio so, Valley quilts. Miami Valley. Miami Valley. Ohio. Oh, thank you for the correction. It's close. It's close. I was almost there. Oh, I was in the room when you guys were picking these out. That's right. You were here when we did our object review. Yeah. So yeah, you've seen these in a different way. In a different and way. Now tell me, or tell us what is special about this particular region, and these quilts are also similar. They have very similar elements in them. Tell us about that. Well, I think it's one of the strongest regional styles, and if there's one thing that I think has really been an eye-opening revelation for me is that as we've gotten more research and more collections are online and we can go to the quilt index and we can look at all of these quilts, what's really been interesting is to see these regional styles. And it makes sense because that's how women learn to quilt is by your neighbors at the fair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's pretty, it was pretty close. Concentrated. and You didn't yeah. have printed patterns. You weren't getting books. You weren't getting magazines. But this collection is, um, most all of it is from Sue Cummings, who was an AQSG researcher. And um, the Jameses helped her publish a book on these quilts and all her research. So she gave us, I think, about 30 pieces. So it's a really big group, and they all have similarities. This was one that was in, um, James has had in their collection, so this was a little mm -hmm. bit unusual because it didn't come from Sue. But she started seeing these quilts, and she and her husband Glenn just were out all the time. They loved to buy antiques, and they started buying quilts, and then Sue started finding these quilts, and they just somehow kind of came to her in interesting different ways. So they're all from around Miami um, County in Ohio. Not all of them are strictly from there, but within that a, a small region. And they all have similar elements to them. Mm -hmm. Through the research, we've discovered many of them were made for young men as they became adults. But this, what we call the Eli Ho quilt, because his name is on it, this was kind of an unusual one because it was made for him. He was the teacher of these students. and. He, they have that little phrase and what is it? I can't read it from here. Something our valued friendship and roll it up in cotton and think it not illusion because so easily gotten. What oh, would that even mean? But here's the presentation and, block. And also the quilting. The quilting and they're quilted itself. in different ways on all the blocks. It's so on much all fun. the blocks. These are Really fun. So this one, this is where the presentation is presented by your scholars at Sunnyside Ohio oh. School. And when we first got it, we had an 1814 date on it. And again, Pat Cruz and I would look at this and be like, well, there's that fugitive green. That's 1870s. What's wrong here? Well, part of the nine has disappeared. Uh -huh. So it's in 1894. And all these were made in oh, the right. 1890 to about 1915. Three of these were made by Gertie Oleander. I think that's how you pronounce her name. She made one for her son, and then she made one for her daughter-in-law that featured her daughter-in-law's maternal side, and then she felt bad, so she made another one for her daughter-in-law of the paternal side. So all three of these were made by the same woman. And almost all of them have the eagle block, which is what really caught Sue's right. um, eye first. But they're just such fun, different blocks. And these chicken, the chicken. <laughs> or rooster, I guess. 
The other thing that's really common on these quilts is these like partial blocks. Like they did, you know, how you, when you, I don't make quilts, but I hear that when you're working with a group, people don't always make them the right size. Yep. So they would add these little crazy little partial blocks yeah. on some of them. Or even on the bottom, you see just a little tiny rim yeah. where they had to make the blocks big enough. <laughs> There's or a rolling they, stone they block, they like half block of it. <laughs> Yeah. So they have, there's all these crazy, fun, shared elements, which means that they were, if not working together, they were at least seeing each other's quilts. Right. But, um, and Sue did amazing research. And if you think about, you know, 30 quilts, each one will have, I don't know how many names on it, 10 to 30 names on it. That is so much research done before you could pop on the internet and go to Ancestry. <laughs> yes. So Sue's research was incredible. And it's really fun to have these pieces. And in addition, her um, husband Sue passed away in 2011, I believe. And Glenn also has given us a collection of Ohio quilts and Ohio coverlets. Ooh. Um, they were amazing collectors and. Um, just so generous, so generous. I just love these. The quilting. And somewhere the on one of these quilts, is... I'm looking at your t-shirts. Is I run with scissors? There's scissors quilted in these quilts oh, yeah. somewhere. So I'm gonna show so... Runs with scissors. <laughs> love it. So when um, Katie Francisco did this exhibition, she did her regular labels, but she also did these extra labels that she called Sue Cummings' Journey. So she talks about how Sue found all the quilts. And really, um, we really wanted to focus on Sue's work in yes. bringing these all together. Oh, that's so clever. That really adds another layer to the whole yeah. thing. Oh, this is very interesting. The animal here with the circular quilting around it, just disregarding the applique completely. That's very interesting. You know, Lena DeMarco and her friends were here. They come every oh. summer to do a week of refolding. And Lena and I, um, we were talking about her new project to study quilting designs, and we were going to try scissors. We were going to try to um, document some of the quilting. And what we learned really quickly is there is so much and so much diversity that it's going to be a really difficult project. Yeah. So Lena. Um, is going to go back and kind of redraft her form and how she logs it and it was just great because we refolded about 300 quilts in a week and so she just kept seeing all of these different things that would come up that she's going to need to think about for her forms and to do that project but i think it's something that's really important because nobody's really studied quilting as a mm -hmm. specific component and um, i think it really needs to be done the challenge is just being able to see it and just be able to see it in right. the quilts. And so it's not going to be an easy project. And that usually takes getting up close to it in person because you, you can't see all of that in a flat photo. No. That was one of the things when we first started publishing our quilts that we were really adamant about with the photographers that they'd have to take photos where we could see the quilting because we were so frustrated when you looked at quilt books because mm -hmm. they just look flat. Yeah, yeah, they really do. And it still is really difficult to do. Yeah. And it's like, just this one alone. I mean, you could spend a week just researching and logging in all of the different quilting like, designs on this quilt oh, by itself. Of the, their little leaves, maybe. And then there's these um, curly that's a big leaf. And then a feather. And a, oh, here's a heart. And we saw the scissors a second ago. Lots of circles. Lots of circles. And hearts. There's some more hearts. And it's interesting because this is by the same name. I guess I was gonna say she could probably use her circles, but she does have a couple here. But she's using clamshell. I love these floral there. It's a couple more hearts. Yeah, here's her circles. Right back in a big way up here. Oh, yep, there we go. This looks like it was quilted as you go, sort of, that, that um, you know, method. Because I wonder. It, I think it would be, because check this out. See the it stitches, breaks. Yeah. it breaks. And the fabrics even look like they might be a little different. Yeah. I don't think you can tell on the back, though, so they might have covered it up if they actually put it together first. But you would think, 
I mean, you could see how that would be a great way to do it with all these varied blocks. But wait, I mean, imagine though how difficult it would be to get all these to fit together. Just look at this one. <laughs> they had to add a whole little strip down the middle here. And this is a muslin mm -hmm. really compared to a, more of a white. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely different fabrics. Mm -hmm. And see how these circles run off. I wonder if she asked everybody to quilt their own block before they cut it. I don't know. Could be. Something to dig into the research on. Yes. Maybe a little heart. And I know, well, I know like the one over here at the very end, that one was quilted much later. That was quilted recently. So that was just yeah. a top. So that one was not necessarily quilted as you go. But you know, there's a lot of variation within them, even as they, as they are a little consistent group. Well, sure, because I mean, each maker's individual. Yeah, and that one looks like it's mostly a grid. This one is mostly a diagonal. But even so, it still breaks at each block. Yep. If only we knew somebody who could show us the back of these things. If only I had a glove with me. <laughs> and I, this is what our, our, our uh, visitors do, and I would get in so much trouble if I mess with I know. I know. People are always like, they take a piece of paper, and they're like, I'm going to see the back of that quilt. And we, get, we catch them on camera all the time. Watch behind you, dear. <laughs> and some of them are really, really... You just had to put in a few of these quilts that are in kind of bad shape. But they're worth it, I think, Look right? I mean, she needed to have this out, didn't she? That's gorgeous. And is that like a little hand holding that? Oh, it is. It's a, oh my gosh. And then the other one has two hands holding each other on it. Oh, it's holding the little flower out. Uh, Ellen Wilcox. And you can find all these people like up and down the road. I mean, they're just, you can find out where they are. We just don't understand what the quilts really meant to them because there's nothing written about the quilts. Mm. So maybe someday somebody will go back and go through newspapers and maybe there's something. You would think so. You know, new stuff shows up all the time, doesn't it? Yes, it Just does. when we think that we're at the end of a research road, yep. something new comes along. Thank you for the tour, Carol. Of course. You get kind of spoiled being Bye. surrounded by quilts all the time. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.